And I'll just say again, if you're here for the webinar on the catastrophe in Gaza, you're in the right place. We've just opened the door. I'm gonna give it about 30 more seconds for people to join us and then we will get started. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this. Hello and welcome, I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is Monday, October 30th, and we've come together today to talk about the catastrophe in Gaza and what's next. This is three weeks into the ongoing war on Gaza, which is um, escalating with impacts uh, in the West Bank and inside Israel. We're gonna talk about a lot of that. First, some housekeeping. Um, as always, the format of this webinar is a QA, and a a discussion between myself and our guests. Uh, there is a Q&A box for people in the audience who want to submit questions. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the conversation. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on that, and our guests will be keeping an eye on that, and we'll try to work in as many of your questions as we can. This is being recorded. It's also being broadcast live on Facebook. Hello to our friends on Facebook. Um, it'll also be released as a podcast, so you can listen to it again or share it with people. So we'll give information about that at the end. I'll also note there's a chat box. The chat box is for chatting with the people who are doing the admin stuff behind the scenes. It's not for chatting with us. If you put things in the chat box, I won't see it and our guests won't see it, so don't. Um, and then finally, we have um, enabled closed captioning for anybody who needs or wants to follow the discussion via closed captions. So. Um, let's just get right into it. This is the first in a two-part series that we're doing on the catastrophe in Gaza and what's next. Our partners that are joining us today are Inez Abdurazik of the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy and Fadi Koran of Avaz. I will introduce them in more detail in a second. Um, the part two of this series will be uh, in two days, November 1st at noon ET. That will feature Sari Bashi of Human Rights Watch and Amjad Iraqi of 972 Magazine. Um, and there will be, uh, I think, information being put in the ch chat right now about that event. So we're holding these two urgent webinars uh, for a few reasons. Um, in the wake of Hamas's massacres of citizens and residents of Israel on October 7th, Israeli leadership has articulated its aim of destroying the, quote, human animals in Gaza, leading many, this goes now weeks ago, to sound the alarm that Israel ha it has intentions that are, are genocidal, the term here, genocidal. This comes in the context of 16 years of brutal Israeli blockade of Gaza and targeting a population, a large percentage of which in Gaza is present there as a result of the Nakba 75 years ago, which left them and their families unable to return to homes in what became Israel. And in the current war, Israel is wreaking incomprehensible levels of civilian death, injury, and destruction, ostensibly in the name of trying to uh, rid itself of Hamas. The possibilities for expanded conflict loom, and not only loom, we're actually seeing expanded conflict, including, or conflict is not the right word, um, including in Jerusalem as being seen in the West Bank, which is getting a little bit more press coverage now. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, in the West Bank, the IDF and IDF-backed settlers have escalated direct terrorism of Palestinians and efforts, some successful already, to forcibly remove Palestinians from targeted areas of the West Bank, which some are calling, including me, are calling ethnic cleansing, and also the, the risk and growing, um, I think, ominous risk of threat with Lebanon. Also inside Israel itself, there's the uh, attempted lynching this weekend of students in Netanya. Um, we, they're Palestinians of citizens of Israel in a dorm. Uh, that lynching was basically supported by the leadership of the city that basically said, we need to get the Arabs out. In parallel, there is delegitimization and repression, which is escalating of Palestinian voices and of support and Palestinian rights around the globe not just in Israel, Palestine, but in capitals, including in the United States. So today and Wednesday, we're going to be sitting with trusted partners who are going to ground us in what's going on, what's at stake, and what's what's well, what's at stake for Palestinians, for Israelis, the broader Middle East, and the rest of the world, what Israeli, Palestinian, and American leadership are envisioning, as they understand it, as next steps, and also for the day after this war ends, and what the opportunities and obligations are for grassroots mobilization, civil society actors, and human rights defenders. Okay, that's the introduction. So we have with us today, 
Inez Abdurazek. Inez is the executive director of the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy and its digital platform, Rabbit, an independent Palestinian organization focusing on international mobilization and digital campaigning for justice, freedom, and equality. Welcome, Inez. Um, I'll also say that the foundation supports PIPD. We love them. Um, our other guest is Fadi Koran. Fadi is campaigns director at Avaz and a popular struggle community organizer. He previously served as UN advocacy officer with, officer with Al Haq's legal research and advocacy unit. And he is someone that we all know very well and look to for wisdom. So welcome, Fadi. We're very happy to have you. Okay, so we're gonna do this in a few rounds. The first round, I... Let's just dig right in. I'm going to assume that most of our audience, they're joining us today because they care about these issues and they're following the news. So I'm not going to ask either of you to take your time summing up everything that's happened on October 7th. Um, I covered a lot of that in the intro. If people want to find out more, it's everywhere. Um, certainly, we have plenty of resources on our website. So let's get straight into the key questions of the day. And I want to start off by talking about genocide. I mentioned that word in the introduction. As context, in addition to the massive scope of killing of Palestinians that we've seen over the past three weeks, and large numbers of people dead doesn't necessarily equal genocide under the international, international law and definition. Um, I want to note that in a speech this weekend, this past weekend, announcing the start of Israel's ground operations in Gaza, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, among other things, you must remember what Amalek has done to us, says our Holy Bible. As many people have pointed out, this is a reference to a part of the Bible, 1 Samuel 15, that gives a green light to genocide against an enemy who is framed as an existential threat to the Jewish people. That text includes, quote, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So that statement, it does not exist in a vacuum. It comes in the context of weeks of statements from Israeli politicians, journalists, and other public figures calling for the total destruction of Gaza and the annihilation of the Palestinian people in Gaza. So with that context, Inez, can you start us off by talking about why you believe the word genocide is being used to describe Israel's actions in Gaza? both with respect to what we understand about Israel's intent and with respect to what it is actually doing on the ground to the civilian population in the Gaza Strip. Thank you, um, Lara. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be with you, even in those circumstances. I think, um, as you said, it's a, it's a difficult moment for all of us, emotionally um, draining, but I think, you know, we have the responsibility. Uh, I have, I feel the responsibility to continue and uh, speak out, explain, you know, analyze is what I can do and, and use my privilege um, not to be under bombs to, um, to sort of, you know, continue and push the conversation forward. So we actually move out of this catastrophic uh, reality. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, this time, I mean, there's been multiple uh, wars on Gaza, attacks, aggressions in the past years. But I think here, um, you know, we don't use this terminology lightly, right? The, the word genocide. And I think here it clearly applies. I think there is a lot of work to do still to obviously um, hold accountable those who are conducting this crime. But I think it's important that we use the right terms and and we are currently facing what uh, clearly, uh, you know, could be described as a crime of genocide. And, and, and what is that? So obviously it's codified. Right. So I'm not an international lawyer, so I, I won't you know I will I will just briefly remind what it means right under uh, international. What's the definition? And um it's actually the first human rights convention that was adopted by the UN uh, in 1948. And basically it defines as acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. And uh, these acts are, you know, killing members of the group, uh, causing, uh, you know, serious bodily or mental harm, imposing uh, living conditions intended to destroy the group, which is very important, and I will go to that, preventing birth and forcibly transferring children out of the group. 
And what we can see is obviously all these acts are being committed uh, in the Gaza Strip. And I think with the intent to destroy the group. Why? Because I think the Israeli uh, government and the Israeli military, uh, the regime is um, always hiding behind the idea that this would be, uh, you know, against uh, uh, terrorism, against a specific group, against Hamas. I think we all know and we all see, uh, given the scale and the the way the operations basically and the attacks are being um, um, driven, that uh, this is just a cover. And we, we can go back to that because I think this very framing of the, you know, the war on terror and the war against terrorism, we all know what harm it has done in the past, what harm is still doing and, and how it's depoliticizing our situation. So what we're seeing now is basically um, what's unfolding in Gaza, right? Like the Israeli um, military and government have uh, deliberately starved uh, Palestinians. Uh, so, you know, by preventing um, any sort of uh, goods to enter the Gaza Strip, um, including water, including food, uh, you know, depriving people of, of electricity and basic living conditions. Um, that That is part of the definition of, of how a genocide is conducted. Uh, killing, obviously, mostly civilians. Uh, you know, uh, you can... Uh, look at the at the numbers that also are being questioned by the propaganda of the Israeli regime. Um, the people who have been killed uh, and injured are, you know, in the vast, vast majority, uh, no one is questioning it, are civilians. And we're talking 60% children. Um, and obviously, as you say, as you as you reminded, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the, the declaration by Israeli politicians have shown the intent. And, and it's not, again, it's not just fringe uh, people we're talking about. We're talking about the ministers, the spokesperson of the army, um, you know, the, the, the prime minister. Uh, so this is, this is very serious uh, because they're here for destruction. They are dehumanizing us, uh, calling us, you know, human animals. Uh, repeating again and again this this um, obviously very dehumanizing phrase that there are no innocent civilians in Gaza and that's being repeated and and circulated around and so that is uh, basically showing that the again I think the facade of of pretending to to fight uh, Hamas we all know that there has been for a long time a politic of um, isolating Gaza, exceptionalizing Gaza, and now the plan is to basically uh, completely destroy Gaza and uh, kill as many people as possible or displace the others. Thank you. And in the next round, we're going to get to the displacement ethnic cleansing piece of it, but the displacement inside Gaza already is, I mean, extraordinary. Um, and actually, that's a good segue. So for, for Fadi, I, I want to pick up on what we just heard from Inez and, and just as some sort of situating things, right? The people of Gaza have faced incredible onslaughts by the Israeli army before. We've had aerial and ground assaults from Israel numerous times in the past 23 years. This time, the destruction and the killing are different. It seems like it's broader. And the tactics that Israel is using are different as as we just heard, uh, we've heard some of them, but can you talk about what's different and, and what is, and I hate to use this word, what is unprecedented? And here we're talking about unprecedented, you know, since Israel has been in control of Gaza. And can you talk about how this unprecedented part relates to the term genocide, whether you're talking about Israel's intentions or the fears of which, the, where this will lead? I mean, some people are more confident saying this could turn into genocide or this may be genocidal or it already is genocide um and and in particular talking about the things that make life unlivable and that make it more difficult for the world to even know what's happening thank you um laura to just to start by adding to the points that Inas mentioned, which are kind of all very strong points and the reference to international law and the kind of definitions under the convention of genocide. I also want to name 
and I think this is important, that the emotional perception of what the Israeli military is doing in Gaza, on the people in Gaza, but on all Palestinians, even if this, let's say, even if we put the definitions in international law aside and everything, as a community, we feel that genocide is being committed against us. And I think that's important to name because just the context of, I mean, if you're Palestinian, you're watching, you're seeing, you're getting messages from your family and friends in Gaza of like their children, whole families being completely destroyed, um, you know, basically wiped out. You're, you're hearing, you're getting calls from people. I spoke to friends in Gaza today that were telling me they're drinking seawater from the Mediterranean because they have no more water left. And so they're trying to like, get as much salt out of it as possible, but then they're drinking it. Um, people I spoke to in the hospital said that they were saying bye to family members that needed dialysis because not, they're not getting dialysis and are afraid that, you know, if enough time passes, they're going to just have blood poisoning and pass away. So if you're just a normal human being and you're seeing that happen to 2 million people of your population, basically at least 20% of the global Palestinian population, and then you hear that in the West Bank, communities are being uh, basically wiped out, kicked off of their land, then it feels like you are being terminated. And I, I put three lines underneath that because I think it's important for people to be able to empathize and sympathize with Palestinians that when we're saying there's a genocide happening, um, we are saying it because we're feeling it. And so to then go and answer your um, kind of questions like what is unprecedented about this. The way I've described this is that um, as Palestinians, we feel that Israel shifts into different gears in terms of its ethnic cleansing and erasure of us. So, you know, it can be on gear five if um, there's like peace process talks happening. So things are happening slowly. Gaza is blockaded. 97% of the water is contaminated but they allow um, enough water to go in so that people don't die of thirst. You know, there was a phase in the Gaza blockade where, as many of the people here know, the Israeli army was literally counting calories in terms of how much food to allow into Gaza. Um, so, but well, where we are at today is if we were at gear five um, before October 7th, we're at basically gear 25 to 30 um, right now. And some of the things, just to kind of keep in context in terms of the scale of the destruction. So the last numbers indicated that at least one in 20 homes in Gaza have been uh, destroyed. So in previous wars, we've reached, I think, the, the ratio of one in 100, one in 200 homes. Now it's kind of five times as many homes destroyed in almost half the time period of the most devastating war on Gaza, which was 2014. And so that's unprecedented. The amount of deaths where we're talking now, we've surpassed the 8,000 number and we've surpassed at least 3,300 children. So that's more Palestinians killed and civilians killed than in the whole period of the second intifada. That's um, almost four times to five times as many Palestinians killed as the most vicious war on Gaza before this one. Um, and and that and that doesn't include the people who are buried under rubble who have not been able to be counted, correct? That is a conservative estimate based on people who are confirmed dead through hospitals and who've been who've been counted. So it's a conservative yeah. estimate. It is it is a conservative um, estimate. I mean, I, I was speaking to people at the Red Crescent um, just a couple of days ago. And these are people that I know in Gaza that work there as medics and so forth. And they were saying that, you know, the way the way they felt that for every life that they saved, there was a life that they couldn't get to. And um, so my expectation is the numbers are going to be even more devastating. I mean, the, the official numbers is that there are at least now 2000 people um, that are under the rubble unaccounted for. My expectation is it may be higher. Um, the other thing that's unprecedented is this communications blackout. Um, the you know, and then the big picture piece that's unprecedented is there's always been, I would call, droplets of genocidal narrative um, that are kind of 
spoken by the Israeli military, by, of course, key ministers in the settler government. This kind of, you know, what I want to call genocidal fervor is we're seeing it at kind of a consistent rate being spoken in the Israeli media and in the Israeli public. Um, so you have, apart from the, like human animals quote, um, you have the spokesperson for the IDF saying to Haaretz that our goal is not accuracy, our goal is destruction. Um, you have pamphlets being dropped at scale telling people to leave. But more importantly, even in the West Bank, we had pamphlets delivered by settlers that say, expect the next Nakba. Um, you mentioned the Netanyahu quote. So all, all of this put together is kind of what I would say is unprecedented in terms of scale and speed. So I also want to I mean, maybe ask before we move on to the next round, in terms of unprecedented, I don't recall there ever being a communications blackout before. Um, and and for me, I have to say the moment, I mean, like everybody else, I spent 36 hours, 48 hours, just constantly refreshing social media, trying to see if people are still alive. Um, to, to cut off all contact in a war zone at the height of what, while you're escalating both air operations and beginning ground operations um, seemed besides incredibly inhumane, it seemed incredibly ominous. Um, and as far as I know, I mean, even during the previous, um, the previous assaults on Gaza, there has never been a total cutoff of food, fuel, and water to the area. Um, and for people who are listening, people need to understand that Gaza is reliant on outside food, fuel, and water. It is essentially an isolated island of territory uh, with internal with access in and out controlled by Israel, except for one border, which is controlled by Egypt in coordination with Israel. Um, so that seems um, extraordinary. And now we're in week three. Um, and I also just want to say for people who may be seeing re reports in the Western media um, about uh, I've seen the word looting, which I it it brings back memories for me of um, of the hur of the hurricane uh, zone in New Orleans and the, the word looting being used by impoverished, destitute people whose homes had been flooded, who were looking for food, um, seemed to be used mainly when those people were black as opposed to not black and for Palestinians breaking into UN stores because they've been starving, looking for flour, it seems like a, a pretty loaded term to be using. They're not selling the flour on the black market. Um, the All right, so I wanna go to the next round. So that's that's genocide. And you both have referenced also the, the the other piece of it, which is ethnic cleansing. So I want to get into this. The, the, the term ethnic cleansing is coming up a lot, including people like me using it. Um, this, again, comes in context of statements by the Israeli government and also what we're seeing on the ground. And I want to reference with the Israeli government. There was weeks ago a report that came out from an Israeli think tank in Hebrew laying out the case that the God, the, that October 7th presented a unique opportunity for Israel to finally rid itself of the Palestinians in Gaza by kicking them out and forcing them on the Egyptians and the rest of the world. We now in recent days have a report from the Ministry of Intelligence, a directive, this has been confirmed as, as real, um, which lays out exactly that strategy and appears to align, even though we're seeing it right now, it appears to align with exactly what the Israeli government has done since October 7th. And all of these are framed as this is an opportunity to push Palestinians out of Gaza, which seems to me to be the dictionary definition of ethnic cleansing, even if it's framed as doing it to address the humanitarian needs because we care so much about Palestinians. So, Fadi, I want to talk to you about this first. So I want you to talk about the idea of ethnic cleansing, what it means and how it fits into what you see Israel doing and what it's expressing as intent. And I also want to ask you, I mean, the term Nakba comes up a lot, and you just mentioned it. It's in the, the settlers flyer that's floating around the West Bank. From the perspective of Palestinians, telling people like this could be a new Nakba or this may be turning it, is is it already a Nakba? Can you can you talk about you talked about the emotional um resonance of what's happening for Palestinians? 2023, is it already the year of the second Nakba? Um, or is this just a looming threat? Yeah, those are great questions. And I would say basically ethnic cleansing in terms of how it's defined is using violence or tactics of intimidation 
to remove an ethnic group uh, from an area, basically to empty an area from a certain ethnic group and to make it homogenous for another ethnic group. And so that's the broad definition. In the context of Palestine, of course, it's speaking about how through the kind of settler movement and through the acts of kind of settler colonialism, through violence, Palestinians are being forced out of certain territories in their land. And the Nakba, as you asked, is what we Palestinians call the ethnic cleansing of uh, that happened of kind of historical Palestine in 1948, where about 700,000 Palestinians were pushed off of their land. And the, you know what is happening today, if you look at different pockets, um, so in Gaza, you know, the, you mentioned the Ministry of Intelligence directive, you mentioned the leaflets drop, telling people um, if they are like living in particularly north of Gaza that they need to move out of that area. And um, there have been discussions and from engaging with Egyptian officials, there have been serious discussions about creating space for Palestinians to be put into uh, Sinai. And of course, there have been consistent calls for that, particularly from the settler right, but it's always been an idea that's been discussed within the Israeli government circles. Um, in the West Bank, what we have seen is that there have been so far nine communities, mainly Bedouin shepherding communities that since October 7 have been forced out of their land or intimidated to leave their land by settlers. Um, tonight, actually, there is significant fear that in the South Hebron Hills, in the area of Umm al Khair and Twani, uh, people got threats that if they weren't going to leave, that they would be attacked by settlers um, and soldiers who came to their community. So, you know, in the context of what is happening here, I don't think anyone can argue that there isn't an effort to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from the different territories that they are present in. Um, it's also important to note, again, that this is not just happening in the West Bank and Gaza, even kind of within Israel, for example, in the Negev, the village of Al-Araqib, um, and certain rules that uh, keep Palestinian villages unrecognized are also attempts to ethnically cleanse them from those areas. So this is the, the context that we are engaging in today. What I would add to that, what increases our fear that ethnic cleansing is going to be accelerated even further is the weaponized, the increased weaponization of settlers. So we saw Ben Gvir and the Israeli Ministry of Interior and the Israeli army handing out at least 10,000 rifles to settlers. And we see the settlers being kind of supported um, at a much accelerated rate to attack Palestinian farmers. Um, in the West Bank, we saw a person killed two days ago by Israeli settlers as they were harvesting um, their olives. So all, all of that basically is um, just continuous evidence that the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians is continuing. The last thing I will say is, is this the kind of Anunakba for Palestinians? There's always been a discussion in Palestine, but I think it's been settled that the Nakba never ended. So the Nakba has continued. It started maybe in 1948, but it continues at different paces. The big fear that we have, and I say this for our listeners, not just from my context and what I see as a Palestinian, but actually from conversations I've had with, um, as part of my work, of course, with US officials, with diplomats from the EU, with Arab diplomats as well, where when the Israeli plans were presented to them, the first drafts as they were discussing it with, with high-level individuals for the different options that they had. Um, what, one of the key scenarios that they expected most likely was that the war um, that is happening on Gaza right now would lead to 25 to 35,000 people killed and 10 to 20 percent of the Gazan population forced out of Gaza, likely into the Sinai. And that one of the key things that they were looking into is whether that level of violence was going to lead to the West Bank, kind of also basically the, the Palestinian authority crumbling and leading to a, a Palestinian uprising here against the violence, which would then be responded to by settlers mainly, but with the support of the IDF. Um, and that one of the scenarios they were looking at is many communities across the West Bank being based on violent attacks by settlers also depopulated. 
and how they would engage the Jordanian government with that, which I believe is one of the reasons that both King Abdullah and Queen Rania have been so very vocal against what's happening in Gaza, apart from, of course, the emotional connection that they have to the Palestinian cause and so forth. I think they also realize that this happening in the West Bank or spreading to the West Bank is going to lead to destabilization. So these scenarios of expanded ethnic cleansing are not, I would say, assumptions to be made, but rather things that are expected to happen at some point based on, again, what Israel showed diplomats and, and foreign kind of uh, actors that are engaging with it on this issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck listening to you. One of the points that I've made a, a, in interviews a couple of times in the past week is, you know, the the listening to the, this point, which I've heard for years from Palestinians, and I've, I've learned a lot on this, is the sense that the Nakba never end and that never ended. And and what I'm thinking now is the analysis I've heard from others, in, including Israeli friends of mine, which is that for some in the Israeli right, the 48 war never ended, right? and that they've been looking to finish the 48 war, which is the realization of Israel's control of all the land between the river and the sea, and the great uh, minimization, diminution of the, the Arab population within that border, which they see as would have been the result of 48 if people had just allowed Israel to win the 48 war as opposed to forcing them to negotiate and stop fighting. Um, with, with that in mind, Inez, I want you to talk a little bit more, or as much as you want more, <laughs> about what is happening in the West Bank. Um, I think that's still not sufficiently understood that this isn't just a matter of being concerned that you know people are afraid it's gonna connect, that, that things are actually heating up, both in terms of settler violence and the, active, the actions of the Israeli government. Um, we have seen um, an escalation in IDF attacks in the West Bank in the past three weeks, um, which I think are, are not not irrelevant to the the framing that this is about a broader a broader battle and and also i mean going with what fadi was saying the fears the concerns you know how it resonates when you have settlers attacking and saying if you don't leave we'll kill you all and when we have leaflets showing up on people's cars saying grab your stuff and flee to jordan now or we're going to expel you so can you can you sort of pull all that together for us Yeah, and I think this this is um, very important, especially because uh, internationally, and you know what we're also what Israel has been uh, actively intenting and 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 uh, manufacturing for decades is the fragmentation of the Palestinian people, and what we're seeing, um, how things are described, you know, in the West, in the U.S., and elsewhere is is basically uh, this idea that this would be a war between Gaza and Israel or like Hamas versus Israel this is not this is um this is a war on Palestine and this is this is an aggression against Palestinians overall and it goes back to the idea that um you know Israel with its settler colonial project um has as Fadi said it was always about erasing the Palestinian the Palestinian presence the Palestinian, national you know culture uh the, the 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 basically the Palestinian national belonging uh, from their homeland in different paces in different times in different methods um and I think there is a continuation of that and and what we're seeing happening in Gaza is obviously Israel has uh located and and put Gaza under siege for for so many years but it also controls everywhere else everywhere else in the territory and that control, you know that 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 hegemonic control, that that violent control, is being exercised in different ways, where Palestinians are uh, obviously living and reacting in different ways. So this deliberate fragmentation, this deliberate separation of Palestinians, has created different realities of Palestinians. And right now, what we're seeing in this current period of chaos is living that aggression in different ways. So, you know, the Gazans are under uh, really a terrible, like genocidal attacks, bombs. But in the West Bank, Palestinians are under the attacks of, of settlers who, again, have been installed, placed there, uh, you know, moved there with obviously through a deliberate policy and, and, and practice of the state, of the regime. 
And so this is this and, is and, ar and armed by and empowered to and use armed and by. empowered now, yeah, by the regime. And so I think this is obviously different parts of the same struggle, of the same situation that are manifesting themselves in very different ways. And so how does it manifest itself now in the West Bank is again what has been happening that was not making headlines, you know, uh, again, where we're, you know, the dehumanization of Palestine is, is so is so uh, much that we've been now we're in this crisis because so many Israelis have been killed and um, and I think now in the West Bank what we're seeing is is obviously the settlers that have been um, uh, emboldened for so many years you know it's it's been many years they've been armed they've been told that they can do whatever they want in total impunity. Uh, no one is, you know, held to account when they attack Palestinians, when they conduct, uh, you know, programs, etc. So now they're being completely given a, a free pass to to basically terrorize Palestinians. I don't use the frame of of terrorism, but but what they're doing is acts to terrorize the the Palestinians and to basically force people to uh, live in fear and 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 be forced to leave, or you know, the the intent is again for them to leave. So what's happening is, is again, in Masafariyata, uh, in South Ebron Hills, this has been uh, communities that have been under threats of ethnic cleansing for uh, many years, and it has been green-lighted by the Supreme Court, and so they're fighting every day to remain. Uh, and right now, you know, the settlers, again, are like, it's a free-for-all where they can just basically terrorize the population and, again, try and make them leave. Um, villages that are surrounded now by settlements uh, again, we're talking settlements that have been built over years and years, infrastructures, roads, tunnels, uh, cities that have completely uh, surrounded Palestinian villages. Uh, the Palestinian villages, you know, are are now being completely besieged also. Uh, and, and people are terrified uh, because the settlers are being armed. Uh, Jerusalem, you know, that has been annexed for for decades now. Uh, the same, you know, the the the, the Israeli uh, population, the people who also have basically occupied uh, parts of, of East Jerusalem and, and, and Jerusalem overall, uh, are being told that it's it's totally fine to to kind of attack Palestinians and under the protection of the uh, military police and 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 the Israeli forces. So again, we're we're seeing that the the Israeli regime is basically facilitating facilitating and letting open uh, in different methods, in different ways, whether it's its soldiers or, or armed settlers, uh, these attacks against Palestinians. And I think if we are to take a step back, uh, it's again, what we've seen happening since, you know, since a century even, but, but let's say since 1948 um, and the, the the very serious, you know, the threat that we see in all this is that it's not new that Palestinians are called animals or, you know, cockroaches. Uh, these all prepared the terrain for massive ethnic cleansing again to happen for for genocide. These are uh, not only narrative and intent, but but that deliberate uh, racism uh, has always been to to consolidate uh, a supremacist. Uh, state and um, so yeah, this is the reality. I'll go back. I'll go later into um, what it means internationally. Thanks. And I, I listening to you. Maybe one of you can, or both of you, want to talk about this at some point. The 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 assault on civil society that that came before this and how it fits into it. I find myself thinking about this when we have the international community doing things like being told to not believe the numbers that are coming out of the Ministry of Health while those numbers are being um, supported and, and validated by human rights um, defenders who are talking to people on the ground, who are taking testimonies. Those same human rights defenders um, dating back now more than two years have been labeled by the Israeli government as terrorist organizations. And my understanding from the Times of Israel today is that there's an effort now to escalate even that legislation to make it easier to go after these organizations and people that support them or work with them. So I, I don't know if that's something you want to touch on. Um, I'm going to come back to Fadi in this round, and I want to talk about what people are asking for um, right now. 
Um, because I, there's there's a lot of people like, well, what should we be pushing for? You you work with Avaz, you're an organizer for Avaz, which is a really cool organization, an international activist platform and network. You are part of a global movement that has been pushing for an immediate ceasefire for weeks now. Um, I want you to talk about that call and I want you to talk about the vision behind it. Why, why are you calling for a ceasefire? What would that achieve um, beyond the obvious of people stop fighting, hopefully for a little while? Um, what does it entail with respect to both Palestinians and Gaza and also Israeli hostages held by Hamas and other parties? Because it's not just Hamas that's holding hostages. And why is this the most urgent call right now? Um, and and the last thing, if you want to talk about it, there are other things, other calls out there, right? For people who don't want to say ceasefire, a term which has now been treated in the U.S. language as anti anti Israel and anti Semitic and pro Hamas. Um, so there's calls for like a temporary pause or a humanitarian pause. Or can can you talk about those distinctions and what they do or don't mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean. The first thing I'll start with is actually our first proposal. So um, after the um, you know horrendous uh, basic massacre that happened on October seventh, the and then the war on on Gaza and where we saw the death of, of like civilians in Gaza began to pile up, the first campaign we ran as a buzz based on speaking with uh, the different relevant governments. Um, is was a what we called a ceasefire for our children. And this was a proposal whereby specifically you would have had, and this was held by mediators, by the way, where you would have had the release of all the civilian hostages, mainly the children and their families that are held by Hamas, in return for the release of Palestinian children that are also in, in many ways can be considered um, kidnapped because they are taken in violation of international law and held in Israeli military prisons without fair trial. Um, and that there would be a three to four day humanitarian pause, which would allow for basic aid, you know, water, food and so forth into Gaza. And that that humanitarian pause would then open the door for a kind of longer ceasefire. Um, but this kind of proposal, we were very, very close, by the way, before the communication cut on Gaza and the kind of current attempt at a ground invasion, we were very close to actually getting that um, mediated something close to that deal where whereby all the civilian hostages held by Hamas would have been released and there would have been a five-day um, humanitarian pause to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. And sadly, um, that deal ended up being uh, destroyed when the Israeli military went into the, the Gaza Strip. Um, then the kind of, and, and this is the central piece to your question, then the kind of key thing we needed to campaign on and that the world was mobilizing around and all humanitarian organizations was a ceasefire. And a ceasefire is basically um, usually a temporary halt of um, the violence that is happening of the war. So Hamas would have to halt any rockets that it's firing. They would uh, release the hostages. Um, and on the Israeli side, there would be a halt to the bombing and bombardment of Gaza. And what everyone from the kind of human rights organizations, from Avaz, from humanitarian organizations, came to, and including the UN, uh, where the General Assembly um, kind of began calling for ceasefire, um, we see that this is the only way to stop the bloodshed that's happening on the ground um, and to move towards a more durable solution that ensures accountability. And this is the important thing to mention about ceasefire. A ceasefire is not a way to just say, okay, everybody stop firing your weapons and stop killing each other and everything will be okay. Sometimes it's misconstrued as that, but a ceasefire can lead to actions taken to ensure accountability. It can lead to a number of different steps that increase the protection and you know safe zones for civilians, um, et cetera. Now, the other proposals that are on the table, because there are many who claim that um, a ceasefire is just not possible because Israel will, uh, the Israeli military and the Israeli government would never agree to a ceasefire. You know, they've set their goal at the, you know, publicly at least as like the destruction of Hamas and uh, ending its military capabilities and so forth. And they would see any ceasefire as a kind of defeat to them. Um, and that the US is supporting 
supporting the Israeli position as we saw the U.S. kind of veto the, you, you know, different resolutions that even call for humanitarian pauses. But the, the kind of what others say is, OK, if you don't want to call for a ceasefire, if you think it's not possible or if you think it's not in the benefit of, um, you know, whatever, the, you know, the Israeli position, then at least call for a humanitarian pause. And what a humanitarian pause is usually kind of very clearly defined time frame where you say that we're not going to fire simply for, um, let's say, um, a day or two days or three days. And in that period, um, basically the only thing that's going to happen is that we are going to uh, ensure that humanitarian aid gets into the population that is severely um, in need of that aid. But I would say that now, what everybody, you know, working in this space and every person with, uh, I would argue, conscience should be screaming at the top of their lungs is a ceasefire. And not just because it's the most life-saving humanitarian thing that can happen, not only because it's what the, the civilians in Gaza who are literally beginning to die of thirst in many places are calling for, but also because if you look at the geopolitical context, um, Laura, what you see is that if this continues the way that it's going right now and gets worse, then we risk a regional war. We don't know, but if, if in the end, for example, Hezbollah decides to open a new front, if in the end the U.S. decides to get involved, we could be facing uh, what I was told could be a 50 to 100 year defining war. Uh, or, or like a war that defines the next 50 to 100 years and where the casualties will go from um, the thousands, which we are seeing now, to hundreds of thousands. So even from a geopolitical context for people that don't care about Palestinian lives, don't care about humanitarian considerations, a ceasefire right now is the best thing that can happen for the people in Gaza, that can happen for the Israeli hostages that are being held by Hamas, it's the best thing that can happen for international peace and moving us towards a direction than the spiral downward that we are moving towards right now. And that's the calculation that has been made by, again, as I said, experts in this field, as well as all the humanitarian and human rights organizations that work on this issue. Thanks for that. And I have to say, as you talk about a potential regional war, I, I think of the, uh, the evangelical uh, Christian right in the U.S., um, which is working closely. And there, there was a, I think Reverend Hagee had an event over the weekend where there was an Israeli speaker. Um, it almost seems like that is what they are hoping for. There's a certain, you know, end times um, play that is, uh, that, that some people are, are actually hoping this turns into. Um, Inez, I want to to turn to you on the same question. And also, so, so first of all, PIPD, Palestine Institute of Public, Public Diplomacy. I want you to talk about what you're mobilizing for. You work with people in different countries in support of Palestinian freedom. What are your priorities now? I also want you to address what I think for a lot of us, when people are talking about a temporary ceasefire or a humanitarian pause to get aid in, or even more, just the the Biden approach, which says we're not calling, we're not really pushing for either, but we have to keep getting aid in. This this odd conception of a world where the world is focused on getting aid in for people while enabling them to continue to be bombed to death while that aid is coming in. Can you can you talk about those things? Yes. Um, you know, I'm more enraged and, and angry at the West, at like the US and Europeans for what is happening because I'm expecting this from the Israelis, right? We've been living under settler colonial uh, brutality and occupation for a while. And I think we're we're expecting this from the Israelis, but the fact that there is a genocide happening online, like live on Instagram, uh, and that the world is seeing that, uh, and yet all the leaders are justifying it. You know, they find ways to justify it. And again, they fall into the trap that we have seen for decades. This is not new that the Israelis will find ways to accuse uh, us of being terrorists, of being anti-Semites, of being liars, of dehumanizing us in order for others to fall in that in that trap. And and, and they are. And that's that's what's more enraging for me. Uh, and for Palestinians, because you know, we're seeing that it's complicity, it's literally complicity uh with with genocide with with ethnic cleansing 
Um, and so what we're expecting is, as Fadi said, I wish that I could focus like always on ending apartheid, on ending, you know, colonialism. But right now the most urgent thing is to get a ceasefire and to get, uh, you know, uh, unrestricted flow of access to, to, to goods. And that's again, the, the terrible thing is that, you know, you have Biden who comes here and then boast about having negotiated 20 trucks. I mean, who are we? You know, this is so outrageous that he can he went back and could actually say to the face of the world that, you know, it's nice because he negotiated 20 trucks of aid. Um, so as you say, I think it's it's absolutely again dehumanizing to call for like pause, just like, okay, so what uh, Gazans would go for coffee and, and they would get a bit of food before being bombed again. Um, so the urgency is is um uh, a total ceasefire. Uh, we obviously know that ceasefires are temporary. So, of course, there is a lot of things that we need to do and we need to organize for the day after. But right now, that day has to come because the Gazans are, cannot take it. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, and obviously what's happening in Gaza is, 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 is terrible and is uh, moving away and distracting and, and, and helping and facilitating what's happening in the West Bank and in the rest of Palestine. So, so that's our demand. And obviously, as you see, uh, not many countries are actually calling for a ceasefire. Um, we can discuss, you know, the people versus their governments. So I think uh, what's very important is to mobilize the people. And we've seen incredible marches around the world from Malaysia to London, um, you know, that our uh, people are marching in solidarity, but the governments are uh, being complicit in this. So this is what uh, we're focusing on. We're focusing also on the information war because this is also an attack that is being fought on the narrative and on on what's happening. We're, you know, we were discussing before the the questioning of the uh, the numbers, etc. We are the only people who have to constantly prove our humanity. You know, we are the only people who the first question we're being asked is to condemn ourselves when we're being attacked. And I think this is very dangerous, again, because it's what is facilitating genocide. You know, and the, there's other historical uh, um, uh, events, like, you know, and the, there was parallels made with Rwanda and how the narrative war, like, how do you start calling people animals and cockroaches and all of this? And then it's it's streamlined. And then you question what people are saying. You know, we, and so we are asked, to prove, to spend energy. I mean, you have the Ministry of Health in Ramallah that had to um, do a report, you know, re releasing more than 7,300 names of, of people who were killed with their names, with their IDs, just to prove that they're not lying. This is dehumanizing. And this is also that, you know, they have to spend their time doing something instead of helping their people who are dying under bombs. So. I think that that is also what we're trying to do is is obviously, hopefully, getting the world to understand that the Israeli government and the Israeli army are used to lie, are used to fabricate evidence, are used to down to to undermine our voices, to to get to silence us. I mean that blackout was obviously you know uh, a way to silence us, killing journalists, and so all of that you know when we're in the space of of trying to inform and mobilize uh, is, 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 is fundamental. And unfortunately, I would say there is a lot of, um, again, actors who are um, facilitating and, 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 and are complicit with the Israeli policy. So the platforms, you know, the digital platforms, uh, they have a responsibility. And just like, you know, they had been uh, pointed out in the Ro Ro Rohingya massacres, what they're doing now, like the online platforms, like social media and digital media, by censoring us, by um, by shadow banning our content, by basically getting the Palestinian story to be shut down, is facilitating what's happening on the ground. It's not just you know words and on the, on online the online space and this information. Uh, uh, aggression and propaganda is having direct impact on the ground and and so that's also what we're 
focusing on to fight that disinformation and to be able also to document. I think like right now is also a way to prepare for the next phase where eventually we hope uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, um, and, and crimes of genocide could be held accountable um, in the near future. Thanks. That that's there's so many pieces of that that I actually want to unpack, and I think we we're going to run out of time before I can. Um, the, I mean, for me, there's a, there's sort of two faces of a story here. One story, one piece of it is that if there there there's one tiny spot of light right now, it's the grassroots mobilizing that we've seen around the world, and I'm going to use the word unprecedented again. I've never seen anything like it, and it is um, support for Palestinians. It's support for Palestinian rights. It's calling for ceasefire. But then there's the flip side, which is an incredibly um, powerful organized narrative, which is, I think, in many ways taken over in the mainstream in the US, which says all of this is pro Hamas, all of this is anti Semitic. We're seeing um, organized backlash, particularly against students, but also people losing their jobs, including Jewish people, including Jewish students. So it's a, it's a push pull. And and you know when when you see the 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 difference in the information that's available, if you look at what's happening directly online, if you go directly to organizations operating on the ground, if you go to human rights organizations versus what's in the mainstream media, it's like we're living in different worlds. So it's that trying to trying to figure out that how, how to fight that. And I want Ines for you to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, Fadi, I want to come back to you though first. One of the really uh, I'm, I'm gonna, this is, this is, you know, I, I just want to dig in directly to the stuff that we hear. So there are a lot of voices out there. We talked about ceasefire in the last round, right? A lot of voices say you can't call for ceasefire. If you look online today, you will see video of Hillary Clinton railing against the naivete of people asking for ceasefire. They clearly don't understand Hamas. The framing here is that it is naive to call for ceasefire because the only party that benefits from a ceasefire is Hamas and it's a victory for Hamas and that can't be allowed. And anyone who's calling for ceasefire is either a Hamas stooge, a Hamas supporter, or a naive idiot or an anti-Semite. And, and, you know, from a different perspective, we've heard since October 7th, the by any means necessary framing, which has been seized on, I think, by a lot of people who want to discredit Palestinian voices today who are talking about Palestinian rights to, again, say that it is all essentially defending Hamas, defending killing civilians. So I want you to talk about from the mobilizing people and educating people's perspective, how, how, how you think about this, you know, where, how does... If, if this is on the mind of everybody I engage, where is the line? How do you frame this, that this is supporting Palestinian rights and, and not about enabling and defending Hamas? And I know that is a, a painful question for me to ask you, um, but this is what I, every conversation I have with family members who respect me and who, who, who want to agree with me who say yes, but. So can you help? Can you help understand that? And again, this goes back to Inez saying Palestinians have to insist on their humanity to even be heard. I am in no way suggesting that you have to answer this to be credible, or that you are assumed to be pro Hamas unless you say otherwise. Those are racist and absurd. Um, and I hope you will take this question in the spirit that is it intended. No, and I, I totally take it in the spirit that it's intended, Laura. And I think it's important to be able to answer these questions, even questions that may be um, illegitimate but loud in terms of where they place Palestinians. And the way I've been answering this, it starts from actually, you know, when we engage with things, especially at these moments where like people are suffering, people are dying, and I want to recognize that the basically what happened on October 7th, for many Israelis, and I'd include for many Jewish people across the world, hit on the nerve of the primordial fear that the Jewish people have um, and trauma that is based on the pain of pogroms and of the Holocaust that has happened. And similarly, for us as Palestinians, the basically the ethnic cleansing, the continuation of it, the violence, the killing of our children has hit on the primordial fear and that we live every day, which is that we are a people that's going to be erased and that our land is going to be taken from us and that our kids are, we're not going to exist anymore as a people. And the reactions that are happening to what's happening on the ground right now 
um, I would say in a large part and how people are reacting to it globally, um, particularly from both communities comes from that place of that primordial fear, that kind of trauma. Now, we need to be able to step out of that framing and look at the big picture, which is what is the future that we want to create for the people, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religion, that live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, right? Palestinians, Israeli Jews, and so forth. And if the future that we see, if the future that, at least based on the people that I'm speaking, that I hope I'm speaking to right now, is a value-based future where everyone has freedom and justice and dignity and where people can flourish and that that's the collective destiny of everyone, regardless of their background, then we need to act in this moment in a way that can create that future. And what I would argue is that, um, again, without kind of condoning in any way what Hamas did, one needs to remember that it's very, very likely that many of the individuals that committed the attacks on October 7th were people that were likely 10 and 12 years old when the 2014 war happened or when the 2008 war happened. And there were people that had watched, just like many kids in Gaza right now, had watched their loved ones being blown to smithereens, their brothers or sisters or even parents. They're people that had to grow up basically not having kind of drinking water. And the question right now in terms of this attack um, and this kind of ethnic cleansing and extreme mass violence that's happening on Palestinians and that are based in Gaza and on Palestinians in the West Bank is, is the continuation of this, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians going to lead to a future that is going to ensure freedom, justice, and dignity for all and safety and security for all? I mean, we the context that we have seen again and again is that extreme uh, violence, the ethnic cleansing, that uh, colonial actions are things that very rarely lead to security, lead to safety for anyone involved. And to a very specific point on then the ceasefire and why it's important in this case is, I think, again, apart from the core principle here, and I can't emphasize this enough, which is the core principle of there are people, civilians dying at a mass scale. And if this was happening in France, if this attack was happening against Americans and you had a child dying every 15 minutes, I think everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what their political stance would say, enough is enough. That this is not a way, even if you have, a, a let's say even if you have an enemy, I asked an individual here that's in the US, I was like, imagine if you had, um, basically a school shooter at a school in your community, very dangerous. Would you condone someone blowing up the whole school to get this you know, school shooter? You wouldn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so again, the kind of response to this is the truth to achieving a future where people are secure, where people are kind of safe, where freedom and justice reigns comes from dealing with the core underlying injustices that exist that have led to this continued rise and escalation and violence. And a ceasefire is a first step to achieving that. And the other goals that are kind of claimed are just, if you speak to any military expert, they may achieve short-term successes at huge cost to Palestinian lives. Here again, if we're speaking objectively, but the long-term goal of kind of what the Israeli military is claiming that it can do, which is kind of completely destroy Hamas or so forth, it's not achievable. And it's definitely not something that can happen through the continuous mass murder of the Palestinian people. What we need to focus on is ending the system of apartheid and the system of subjugation. And there is a lot of, I would say, propaganda, a lot of manufacturing consent. Um, and I would argue that what we finally see happening right now is not a war on Hamas um, anymore. It's the a war on the Palestinian people. It's the continuation of the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. And that's the kind of key reason why a ceasefire is important at this moment. 
I, I agree with that very much. Inez, I want to come back to you. Um, we're running out of time, but I've got two more questions. Um, so coming back to the question of mobilizing, I, I want you to talk about the kind of possibilities you're seeing for mobilizing, what's emerging. One of the things that I've been talking about a lot is um, the with with Israel's very public framing for this war and the framing which basically says Hamas is responsible for every single man, woman, and child who we kill or who dies of starvation or thirst or whatever um, because they started it and human shield, as Fadi was just saying, there is no Israeli responsibility or agency for anything it does because of Hamas. And I'm interested in your thoughts in terms of what you're seeing in international organizing, international mobilizing, to the extent that people understand the, the, the threat that this sort of framing poses far beyond the Israel-Palestine context um, for other peoples, for other conflicts, um, and and just more broadly, where you see um, where you see organizations or, or possibilities for for the kind of mobilizing that potentially could could lead to real pressure um, on the Israeli government, on the U.S. government, on, on the U.K. government, thinking of the governments that are most problematic, the German government right now. Yes, indeed. I think in terms of framing uh, and, and, and the policy framing and then the narrative framing has um, consequences much beyond Palestine and Israel. So one, I think it's very important uh, that to every, everyone to, to, to push and, and to remember and to, and to repeat that this is not something between uh, Jews versus Muslims. This is not a clash of civilization. This is not an it's very important not to essentialize this. Um, and I know, again, we're in an emotional moment. And I think we have to recognize how some Jewish people feel, how some Muslim people feel. That's normal. But by by pushing such framing uh, and narrative that are then having consequences on political choices that are made uh, is very dangerous. And we need to move away from this. We need to remember this is a political uh, struggle. This is a colonial and anti-colonial struggle. Um, and and it's it's very important to, to repeat that and to understand that. And of course, and then so that also allows to avoid very uh, dangerous and stupid comparisons between Hamas and ISIS and, you know, all of what we're hearing that's, uh, again, extremely dangerous. And so that because we need to move away from this, because I can tell you that I saw just yesterday in France, um, there was a, a, a climate protest or a, a, something around an environmental project. And someone in a newspaper wrote, you know, just like Hamas is, is uh, just like Gazans are a victim of Hamas, you know, the people of this place are a victim of eco-terrorists. It's very, it's very fast and easy, you know, to use that terrorism framework. And the terrorism framework has been used post 9-11 against people of color, against black folks, against you know, um, in the US. And so that can only uh, make a lot of vulnerable people, people that are marginalized, uh, suffer from such framing. So, that, so that's one. And um, I think the, the other one is obviously that uh, Israel as, as a, again, as a ethno-national state, as a, as a regime is exporting very harmful uh, uh, ways of conducting like a uh, very harmful model for the world. So whether it's through their cyber surveillance technologies, uh, their military weapons, their their military equipment, uh, and their doctrines, uh, these these doctrines, these these equipments, these material material or immaterial political uh, thinking is being exported and 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 promoted worldwide, and it is harmful for. Uh, other people where their regimes are adopting, you know, Israel's playbook. So I think it's very important for us to, to also reflect that in building active solidarity. We're not just asking people to be em em empathizing with us, but it's also that it's in the interest of everyone. Liberating Palestinians is in the, in the interest of liberating everyone. And I think this is what we're trying to, to promote and to, to create active solidarity, active networks, um, and this again is is a lot needs education. It needs informing, uh, and it needs for people to hold their uh, elected officials and their governments um, accountable. And again, with the some immediate demands, 
But I think calling for an arms embargo is very important. Uh, and this is not just to protect uh, Palestinians and Palestinian civilians, but also to protect others from importing very harmful um, arms and weapons and technologies, for example. So I'll stop there because I know we're running out of time. But um, yeah, that was just a few thoughts. No, and I think that's a very helpful place to leave it. So, Fadi, I'm going to give you a last word because I'm quoting you at you, which is I, lo I love to do that. Um, so you posted online this weekend, our freedom is inevitable. Given where things are today, I'm not asking you to give people some great speech that's going to, oh, I have hope. But but I want you to explain. I want you to explain that because I also, listening to Inez, I keep thinking about, I think it's, it's Angela Davis, that, that Palestine is the litmus test for humanity or something like that. I'm probably misquoting that and misattributing that. People feel free to write in and tell me I'm wrong. But this idea that Palestine is this litmus test for humanity and freedom is inevitable. So can you can you take that on in, in, in your, this final question? Look, you're giving me all the easy questions today, Laura. Um, but there's no no easy questions on this topic. You know, I was I was just looking at um, you know, when you have these great moments um of just huge fear and also huge challenge, they also need a lot of courage, and it's important to put them in the context of history. And you know, the US carpet bombed uh, Hanoi and Vietnam. Um, over a million people were killed there. Uh, France ended up murdering at least a million Algerians uh, throughout its colonization of Algeria. In South Africa, hundreds of thousands of Black South Africans um, and people of color were imprisoned or casualties of the apartheid regime. And no matter what level of just inhumane violence is practiced against the population, um, more often than not, they find a way through their struggle to come back and achieve their freedom. And I think we are at this moment where I don't think Palestinians' freedom is you know, just going to happen um, magically, but I think that we are at this moment of significant paradigm shifts for, for both people, uh, for Palestinians and for Israelis. And this moment of kind of this shift, the, the level of violence that we're seeing right now is beginning to transform Palestinian society away from the kind of an understanding of our like leadership. It's, and this has been, I would say, developing over the last years, of course, but just we have come to understand how important it is going to be for us to come together and unite and design strategies for struggle that maintain the moral high ground and that help us achieve the future that we seek. And that no matter what attempts have happened to erase us as a people, um, these attempts have so far failed and I believe will continue to fail. And so that's why I think our freedom is inevitable, but not just because of Palestinian agency. I also so many Palestinians were moved by Jewish Americans in New York and when they did that sit-in in Grand Central. And even today, there were many people, including in Israel, um, of you know Jewish people in, in Israel and also across the world who were protesting against their government and against the kind of this basically fascistic attack, I would argue, against the Palestinian people. And I think if we can bring those kind of powers based on the values that we all align with and connect that to the mass mobilization across the world. We're doing a calculation, but so far it seems like the protests that happened to for a ceasefire and calling for Palestinian rights last weekend were the largest global protests to have happened in the last two decades for any cause. And so I just think that all of these things together, if we can just organize ourselves better, remain resilient in the face of all just the challenges that we're facing, that we are going to be free one day and that our freedom is not just going to be the individual freedom of the Palestinian people. I think that's really what's going to transform the whole region into a region that respects the dignity and basic freedom of people, again, regardless of their religious or ethnic backgrounds. Well, thank you. That is a perfect place to leave it here. Um, so we're going to close it off here. I want to thank 
Inez and Fadi, thank you so much for participating in this webinar today. I want to remind people that this was part one of a two-part series. The second part will be this Wednesday, November 1st at noon Eastern time, featuring Sari Bashi from Human Rights Watch and Amjad Iraqi from 972 Magazine. You can find more about Inez and Fadi on our website. We'll have a page with the video from this, uh, this webinar with links to resources related to both Fadi and Inez's work and what they're doing and other resources that we think might be useful. And we'll also be releasing this as a podcast so you can share it and listen to it that way. So I wanna thank everybody so much. And uh, with that, we'll close it until round two on Wednesday and wishing both of you uh, resilience and safety. And uh, we'll be we'll be back in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you, FMAP team. Thank you, thank you so much.